Psalm 24. I'm going to read it, the whole chapter, because, man, I could say whatever, but I can't say it as good as the Word can. You guys believe in the power of the Word? We all believe in it, but, man, none of us spend enough time in it, do we? We're going to be challenged and encouraged to dig deeper this morning. Psalm 24 says this. It says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord, vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Let's say that last line together. Say, he is is the king King of of glory. I love God's word. And even as I say that, I have a confession. I don't spend enough time in it. And so can I encourage you this morning as you encourage me? Can we encourage each other? Is that okay? Will you encourage me? Because I need your encouragement. Will you encourage me? I need your response. Are you you with me? I'm here to encourage you so you can encourage me so we can go deeper together. Psalm 24 talks about this relationship with God. It comes from David, a man after God's heart. A man who sought after God, and I love that he's known as a man after God's heart because it's interesting, you know, I think of David, and I think of that. I think of David was what? He was a man after? Man, we learned that. Like, that is kind of the anthem when you think about David. And it's interesting because the second thing I think about David is either that he fought Goliath or that he had an affair with Bathsheba. (laughs) Somewhere in there, but honestly... I think of David as a man after God's heart above either of those two. And I want you to think about that because David did good things. He killed giants and David did bad things. He had an affair. And yet still, how he is known as a man after God's heart. So I want you to be reminded this morning that you are not defined by what you do. You are defined by who God says you are. David is a man after God's heart. And I want you to hear this today as I look out over your beautiful faces and I see you, I want you to know that God loves you. You're like, Nick, I know that. No, listen, you need to hear it again. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Now today, if there was a theme for the message, it would be this. Jesus is the reset. Jesus is the reset. It's a reset from all the things we turn to. It's a reset from all the things we don't turn to. It's a reset back to the life we were made for. You say, Nick, what do you mean? Well, let me tell you a story, okay? Now, I got a book, just a little plug. If you are encouraged by the word this morning, I got stories of this reset story of how it has moved all over the world, okay? But reset started in North Dakota as we were praying for revival. We were praying for God to move. We were praying because we were afraid. We were praying because we were struggling with addiction. We were praying for all the right reasons and all the wrong reasons to pray. How many know God meets you when you're doing the right thing and he meets you when you're doing the wrong thing? He's after us. And we were praying, and all of a sudden, God started to move, gave us boldness. This movement launched. Our friends started to come to Christ. In fact, so many kids were coming to Jesus, but we were having a hard time because most of these kids didn't understand any of the Bible words that we used. Say, what do you mean? We use these words. We're like, hey, come on and be saved. We're like, saved? 
Saved, saved from what? What are you talking about? Come and be born again. Born again? What in the world are you smoking? <laughs> or like you these Christian events, say, hey, come forward and meet with the counselor. People be like, a counselor? Like, I don't even know you, and I'm going to come up in front of everybody with a counselor? I don't need no counselor. They have all these interesting words. And there was a student who was saying, we were praying, like, man, how do we describe this relationship with Christ, this amazing thing we have to a biblically illiterate generation? And he said, Nick, I think what we're praying for is a reset. We said, what do you mean? He said, well, I play a lot of video games. We said, yeah, dude, we know. <laughs> and if you play a lot of video games, you think people don't know, everybody knows. Listen, you, they know. And probably the, tr the, tr the truth is you probably need to play a little less video games, need to bathe a little bit more, okay? That might be a word for you this morning, okay? <laughs> a lot of video games being played. But listen, this guy's playing all these video games, and he says, listen, when I am playing the video game and it doesn't work anymore, I hit the reset button. Reset button gets it working again. I said, okay, that's good. Let's look into it, though. Let's do a little research. And what we found about the term reset was amazing. And I want you to get this, because what we found out is that every piece of technology is designed by someone who is obviously really smart, but they design it knowing that you and I are going to mess up the system. How many people are good at messing up the system? <laughs> hey, we download the wrong things. We plug it in with the wrong cord. We do all these things. And it's like, it is designed knowing. It's designed for user error. Okay? And so they build in either a button or steps for a reset. And reset means this. It means to clear past errors to get the system working toward its intended or created purpose. Let me say that again. Reset means to clear past errors and get the system working toward its intended or created purpose. Anybody got any past errors today? Anybody want to get back to their intended purpose today? Man, we chase down the right thing, we chase down the wrong thing, we chase down this path, we chase down that path, and we get on some path, we don't know how we got there, but that's where we are. Help us, Lord. So I want to tell you today that Jesus is the reset, and I want to give you three simple steps, three simple points that I believe God wants to use to encourage you. Now, it might not be used for your neighbor because they're not paying attention. Don't let them distract you. Some of you won't get this. Some of you will. I want you to be the one that gets it. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. 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 Number one, you got to be still. Now, I heard Pastor Max been talking on this for like four weeks. I didn't even know that. Apparently, the Holy Spirit wanted you to hear it again. Be still. Be still. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's. Everything in it. Say everything. everything. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, in the world and all who live in it. You see, all this stuff, it's God's. Go outside, that's God's. Here's the problem, guys. We are so busy. We're so busy being busy. We're so busy doing whatever it is we're doing. We don't even know what we're doing. We don't know why we're doing it. We don't know where we're going, but we're going to get there. And we're going to be busy the whole way. Get in the car, turn on the radio, listen to Spotify, pull out your phone, text your friend, call your neighbor, get home, pull out this, pull out that, turn on this, turn on that. It is noise and static and busyness all day long from morning to night, and we are exhausted. And we are weary. And we keep thinking, I just need to do more, do more, try harder, try harder, do more, do more, try harder, try harder, do more, do more, try harder, try harder. Ooh, you're a failure. Do more, do more, try harder, try harder, do more, do more, try harder, try harder. You're not enough. Now, I brought this this morning because I wanted to have like a prop. Be still. You guys ever seen one of these? This is called a pillow. <laughs> Can you imagine? I was thinking about this in between services. I haven't said this. Any other service. Can you imagine like having seen pillows your whole life but never knowing what they do? Or never experiencing their benefit? 
Can you imagine that? Like you've just seen pillows your whole life. Well, they're really nice round objects. They seem soft, but I'm not really sure what the purpose is. You know a pillow is meant for comfort? This pillow, my wife tells me, is a decorative pillow. Some pillows are called throw pillows. Some pillows you're not even supposed to lay on. They're just supposed to be decorative. So don't, honey, don't touch that pillow. Don't get your feet on that pillow. It'll flatten it. It won't look as nice anymore. I'm like, what are you talking about? Don't put a pillow out if you don't want my feet on it, okay? <laughs> Some of you know that God offers you comfort, but you have never been comforted by him. Some of you know that God offers you rest, but you never rest in him. You know all about all the good benefits of it, but you're not living in it. Let me just kind of, we're going to go there. Are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, man. This is a good word. This is my favorite sermon I've ever preached. Does anybody ever lay down and feel worse? Listen, I'm not telling you to take a nap, although that might be what God wants for you. You know, I think one of the reasons that Sabbath is so important is because sometimes we think the most spiritual thing we can do is to do more, when I think the truth is that sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to rest. Because when you rest, you're saying, God, you can handle it. I can trust you. We need to learn to be still. You say, yeah, I be still all the time. Yeah, you do with your phone out. I'm just having quiet time. Texting, tweeting, snapping, posting. Be still. No, just be still. Be present. Now, can I tell you something that's helped me? I have three things I tell myself. Can I tell you? Three simple truths. They're biblical, but these are three simple truths. I just remind myself. I want you to write them down. Number one, I tell myself I am loved. God loves me. And I know it, but I don't know it. You know what I mean? I've heard it my whole life, but man, I know he loves me, but a lot of times I don't feel loved. Number two, I am his. I'm his child. Number three, he is enough. See, a lot of us grew up in a home, whether mom and dad were around or not, or mom and dad were around and they were so busy, or maybe because of how they were raised, we maybe didn't get a lot of affection, or maybe we didn't get a lot of affirmation. Maybe there wasn't a lot of I love you's going around the house. Not a lot of I'm proud of you going around the house. Not a lot of just embraces for the sake of embrace going around the house. And so a lot of us learned, or maybe we had that, but maybe it was somewhere else, but we learn in our culture that you will only be loved by what you do. And so we get in this mindset that I need to try harder to get your approval. I need to put out a good front to have you like me. I need to please and strive and do and go and be and try and do and go. And it is exhausting and there is no foundation to it. Because we're in a performance mentality. And then we translate that to our relationship with God. And then we feel this sense of, man, God will only love me if we know it's about God's grace, but we keep trying to earn it. And I want to tell you this morning that God loves you because he loves you. You can do nothing to get him to love you more. Your security is found in what he did, not in what you need to do. When he said it is finished, he didn't say it will be finished after you do more stuff. No, it's finished. It's done. It's over. It's yours. 
Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are we willing to be still, to be known, to let him love us? You know, I was thinking about my kids, and I have uh, two kids, six and three. They're the best kids. I love them. They're at that awesome time. Parents, you remember when your kids were at that amazing time, you just want to freeze it? Just want to freeze it. They actually get along right now. They think each other are cool. They run to me when I come home. It's just the best. And I'll see about my kids. Like, you know what I want for my kids more than I want anything else? I want them to be with me. Just think about it as a parent. Like, isn't that like your greatest delight? Like, yeah, I know there's stuff they need to do, and I know you want them to behave, but more than anything, don't you just love when they're like, you're together? And they're happy? Like, God's desire is you. But the problem is we're so insecure that we don't believe that. You know, it's interesting, when, when Jesus tells us to love the Lord your, our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, like, if we loved God with everything and we knew everything that he had for us, you know, then we would be able to love our neighbor as ourselves. but the problem is, a lot of us don't love ourselves. Love my neighbor as myself? I hate myself. I don't even want to look at myself. I am the most annoying person I know. And yet God looks at you and says, man, I'm proud of you. Man, I love you. I mean, just imagine if you were able to live your life from a place of being loved. Not from a place of being weak, empty, frail. Number two, be filled. Number one, be still. Number two, be filled. I wanted to grab some illustrations this morning that would uh, be everyday things. So I was like, okay, we all need to drink water. Be still, be filled. Now, I want to say this. To be filled, you need to be emptied. To be filled, you need to be emptied. A lot of our problem is we're full of the wrong stuff. Somebody said, you're full of it. They're right. They are right. Doesn't that make you thirsty? Or it makes you have to go to the bathroom. Oh, that's good. You know, if you were wanting to run a race, a marathon, and you're training, and somebody said, hey, you need to drink a lot of water. You need to drink a ton of water. Nobody would be like, you're so legalistic about water drinking. Stop trying to bash me over the head with your water. You're so judgmental with your water. No, because everybody would know, like, you will die if you don't drink water. In the same way, you don't go into the cell phone store and be like, my phone doesn't work, my phone doesn't work. I can't figure out it doesn't work. It doesn't work, it never works. I never, it doesn't work. My phone is so broken. It doesn't work, it's a piece of junk. And they grab it and they're like, yeah, it's dead. When's the last time you plugged it in? You're like, I don't need to plug it in. It should just work all the time. I want the phone that works all the time without plugging it in. Give me the phone that will just work forever, no plug-in. They're like, that phone doesn't exist, okay? I can sell you a new phone, but what your problem is can't be fixed in this store. You need therapy. Listen, I want to tell you, and I'm not even dogging on therapy. I think it can be good to get therapy. I think it can be good to get help. But what I am telling you is that God made you to be filled. If you don't got the power, you got nothing to give. Now, I want you to hear this because, again, this is what we do. We take this spiritual invitation from God and we start to get performance in our mind. You hear, be still. Like, yeah, that's my problem. 
I'm never still. That's my problem. I just need to do stillness. <laughs> Try harder to get still. It's like our personal life coach comes out. Come on, be still. Just, just, just try harder. Just be still. You need to be filled. That's my problem. That's my problem. See, that's right. I am a failure. I'm not enough. That's, that's it. Oh, man. I'm never still and I'm never filled. So I'm just going to go home and I'm going to be still. This is the time I mean it. I'm going to be still this time. I'm going to do it. This is the time I'm going to do it. No, listen, don't do it. Just be. This isn't a doing problem. This is a being problem. You're not doing because you haven't learned to be. Jesus said, if you remain in me, if you abide in me, if you stay with me. It's like Jesus is all up in this nice ride, and he's like, hey, you want to roll with me? You want to hop in? Because we're going to go to some amazing places that you ain't never had access to before. But if you come with me, I'll take you there. Now, you don't got to do anything. You just got to be like, okay. That sounds like a good idea. I'm with you, Jesus. But man, you got to be willing to be still. You got to be willing to be filled. And you can't be filled if you're not getting in the book. If you're not getting down on your knees and saying, God, I need your help. Now, I'm not telling you today, I'm not being like, hey, let's all get out of here. And this week, we're all going to read the entire Bible in Greek and Hebrew. And then we're going to get into the lexicon. And we are going to go after substitutionary atonement. And we're going to solve it. Listen. Doing, 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 doing. I mean, how many of you guys have like, had this good intention but you tried to do too much, and then you just failed again? I'm just saying, listen, where are you right now? Last week, maybe you didn't get in your Bible at all. Maybe this week you get in the Bible once. I mean, maybe you do every day. That'd be cool. But I'm not telling you to, like, I'm not expecting you to land on the moon this week. Let's be real. Maybe it's a couple days. Maybe it's every other day. Don't be hard on yourself. Ask God for help. Say, God, I need your grace. Holy Spirit, would you move in me? Would you flow through me? God, I need you to do what I can't do because you can't do it. You've been trying a long time. You know where it's got you. You're not content where you are. You're weary where you are. So God needs to do it. So God, I need you to come in. I need you to remind me who I am. I need you to remind me whose I am. God, help me to be still. Help me to rest in the fact that you have accomplished everything for me. I want to boast only in the cross. I want to know the power of your Holy Spirit. Help me to be reminded every day that I'm loved. Help me to feel loved. I pray that a lot. God, help me to feel loved. Would you remind me today, God, that you love me? Help me to remember that I'm yours, that I'm your child. And you're not ashamed of me. Like all those negative thoughts, those aren't from God. And you need to learn to throw them back to hell where they came from. It's being still. It's being filled. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4 says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who doesn't lift up his Soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Again, in order to be filled, you need to be emptied. There needs to be an admission that we have turned to the wrong things. Prophet Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. We know we're empty, and so we fill it with everything else. You say, what do you mean, Nick? What are you by filling it with? Well, you're filling it with her, him. You're filling it with her. You're filling it at the club. You're filling it at the bar. You're filling it at your office. You're filling it in front of your Netflix. You're filling it at the refrigerator. You're filling it anywhere you can. 
turn in every which way except for the one way. Some of the things we do aren't even bad things. It sometimes is the good thing that gets us in the way of the best thing. But for most of us, it probably is kind of kind of bad things. And you can feel it in your soul because you're thirsty. You're hungry. You're weary. That's not from God. Our body, our spirit testifies against us, reminds us, this isn't what I made for you. This isn't who I made you to be. Be still, be filled. Number three, we got to be sent. We got to be sent. David in Psalm 24 said, this people, this generation, they will receive blessing from the Lord. They will receive vindication from God. Verse 6, I love this verse. It says, such is the generation of those who seek him. Those who seek your face, O God of Jacob. David was a man after God's heart. He did some good things. He did some bad things. But God looked at him and said, that's my boy. You're not defined by your past. You're not defined by your present. You're not even defined by your future. You're defined by who God says you are. Got a friend uh, named Sammy Rodriguez. He's a pastor. He said, you're not defined by the hell you've been through. You're defined by the heaven you're going to. Now, I believe that God is here. Now, again, I wanted something simple, so I got be still. thought, when you grab your pillow, what did you think? God, you're inviting me to stillness. Next time you grab some water, be reminded that God is inviting you to be filled. Say, man, my soul thirsts for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? God, protect me from searching after everything else. Be sent. Thought about a briefcase. Nah, backpack, no. Shoes. We all put on shoes every day. I thought, man, when I put on my shoes, am I reminded that I'm sent? Now notice, none of these say, do stillness, do filling, do sending. Oh, it says be. Be. Be still. Be filled. Be sent. I didn't grab any shoes. I grabbed a pair of Jordans. You can tell I like Jordans. You know, there was a song back in the 90s about Michael Jordan. It was on a Gatorade commercial. It say, you know, like Mike, if I could be like Mike. And there was a preacher one time I heard in India, and he said, can you imagine if somebody was preaching and offering to be filled with the spirit of Michael Jordan? And I thought, man, that'd be amazing. So I played it on my mind a little more. Can you imagine if we had an event at U.S. Bank Stadium, and we're like, we are going to be giving out the spirit of Michael Jordan to everyone who comes to the event. I'm telling you, white people from around the world would come so they can jump. A lot of us would show up because I'm like, man, you imagine that's MJ. He's the greatest ever. Come on. Some people say, no, LeBron's the greatest. Man, come on, man. Not even making the playoffs this year. Give me a break. But Michael Jordan, man, he was just, you couldn't stop him. Man, the spirit of Michael Jordan came in me. I'd drop 63 on you all day. I'd come in 35 points in the first half against the Blazers. I'd come in and get those six titles. I'd be wearing those rings. But I want to tell you today, you don't need the spirit of MJ because you got the spirit of the Most High God. Yeah. See, we're chasing after the wrong stuff when we got the good stuff. Man, you don't just go to work tomorrow. You're not like, man, I'm just a teacher. Oh, man, I'm just a stay-at-home parent. I'm just pushing pencils and doing spreadsheets. I'm just going to school. No, my friend, 
You are a son or daughter of the Most High God. You are full of the Spirit of God. You have an invitation every day that you are not alone, but he is with you, he is for you, and you are an undercover agent that is about to come out into the sunlight and say, man, I'm here to love you in Jesus' name. I'm here to bless you in Jesus' name. I'm going to wrap with this story. See, we were traveling a couple years ago, really felt this reset message on our hearts. We grabbed our families. We said, we're going to go across the country. We're going to preach this message. And uh, we're like, man, we need an RV. And so we're praying for an RV. We didn't have any money. And somebody from North Dakota donated an RV to us. Man, it's amazing, an RV. We didn't know any of the questions we should have asked about the RV. Like, for instance, was it winterized? We didn't ask that one. So there's a lot of stuff on that RV we found out didn't work after we had left. And there was many times where we were driving the RV and things were breaking down and we had gas smells in the back and all kinds of weird stuff. And our wife would be like, is everything okay? And we're like, yeah, honey, it's fine. We'd be like, what are we doing? We're going to die. Well, one day we're driving in the RV and we went from Texas to Florida, we went to New York, we went to Seattle, we literally touched every corner of America, and everywhere we went, we said, God is offering a reset. He's offering a reset. I say it today. He's offering a reset. There's a second chance. He's offering a reset. There's a second chance. You are not too far gone. You are right where God has you to respond in this moment. You are not too far away. You have not wandered beyond the grace of God. His arm is not too short to save. Well, one day when we're driving, we're sleeping, somebody's driving through the night, we would do it every day, because we had to get from city to city, and the RV broke down. Smoke's piling out it. We're like, what's going on? We called it the Jesus Mobile. We're like, the Jesus Mobile can't break down. Laying hands on it, it wasn't working. Come to find out the guy who was driving the night before had one of those sleepy driving moments. Have you ever had one of those moments where there's no reason you should be driving, but you're driving, got to the gas station, was trying to decide what pump to go, put $400 of unleaded gasoline in our diesel RV. Awesome. RV broke down, several hundred dollars to tow it into the nearest city. A couple thousand dollars to get in the one specialist in this city who knew how to handle this kind of diesel engine, had to siphon out that unleaded gasoline, had to pull apart the engine, had to get oil and all kinds of things fixed, put it back together, and we were like, we were already broke, now we're broke broke. What was that for? But then I've thought about that story, I'm like, man, isn't that a visual demonstration of what so many of us look like? Smoking on the side of the road, made to go across the country, and you're broke down. Now, maybe nobody sees it because you're putting on the right clothes and the right plastic smile. And praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. But God sees you. I mean, that's just for us that are in the church. It's also a demonstration of a generation broke down struggling, depressed, suicidal, trying to fill their life with everything that's wrong. You don't fill a diesel engine with unleaded gasoline and expect it to work. And you don't fill a life with everything else except for the Spirit of God and except to find any peace. You're putting into your life all the wrong things and you're getting the results. But today I want to tell you that if you feel broke down, consider it a gift from God. Because he has brought you to that place, and it may have taken you getting there to realize your need for help. You see, we had to have a specialist come in. It cost us thousands of dollars. And I've thought about it, man. I'm like, we had to have a specialist come in for our soul. All of us were broken. All of us had put in the wrong thing. All of us have turned to the wrong thing. All of us. And so God sent the only answer, his one and only son. It cost us a few thousand. It cost him everything. And Jesus came on a rescue mission, sent 
from heaven to earth for you. And he took on, as that guy siphoned out that gasoline, Jesus took on the sins of the world. It cost him everything. He shed his blood for you. There was no more payment that needed to be paid. He paid it in full. And then he conquered it. Your sin, your shame, your guilt, your pain, your death. He defeated it all when he rose from the grave. And he is alive today in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And he's still inviting people to come. I wonder, is there anybody here that needs a reset? Is there anybody here that's done trying? You're weary. You know what your need is. You may have been in church every Sunday. You're like, man, I'm weary. You may have never come to church. You're like, man, I'm weary. I want you to bow your heads with me right now. Simple invitation today. God is so good, isn't he? He loves us when we don't love ourselves. He is faithful when we are faithless. There's no mistake that you're here today. And I want to plead with you to not leave this place without doing business with God. If you're here today and you're saying, man, Nick, while you were talking, I know that I need a second chance. I need what Jesus alone offers. If that's you, you don't need to explain it to me, but you're like, man, I, I just need this. I need a reset. You don't have to describe it, but if that's you, I want you to just put your hand there so I can see you. Everybody's heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you, just throw your hand up. Throw your hand up. I want you to think with your hand out, I want you to think of it as you reaching out to God. Not reaching out for me to even see, but you're reaching out to God saying, God, I'm, I'm reaching for what I can't do. And I need you. You can put your hand down. I'm going to ask you to take it a step further. Some of you raised your hand. Some of you should have, and you were too afraid to do that. I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to ask you to stand up in just a second here. But nobody stands alone. So here's what I want you to do. I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I'll stand with you. And if one of you wants to stand, or both of you want to stand, you stand together. Is that okay? Is that okay, church? This isn't a judgment time. This isn't a who's better than who time. This is an invitation to get right time. We all need to get healthy sometimes. Thank God for doctors. If you're here right now, Jesus is here. And he wants to meet with you. Again, I want to plead with you. Take this moment. On the count of three, turn to your neighbor, say, I'll stand with you, and then you stand together. One, two, three. Go ahead. If either of you wants to stand, you stand up right now. And we can make some noise for people as they stand in response to what God's doing. I just feel such a strong sense this morning that God is moving in our midst. And we just wanna pay attention to these moments. Is there anybody else? I want you to turn to your neighbor again and say, are you sure? I'll stand with you. Let's just bow our heads together. I want you to put your hands out in front of you and. It's just a sign of surrender. We're just surrendering together. We're letting go of the weariness. We're letting go of the shame. We're letting go of that negative self-talk. And we're just saying, God, we need your word to speak to us. 
We need your spirit to minister to us. God, we need the power that you alone can give because we can't do it. You pray out loud all together. Say this. Say, dear God, dear God I'm, yours. I'm yours. You're mine. You're mine. I, need you. I need you. I believe that your son died for me on the cross. That my guilt was paid in full. That he raised from the dead and is alive. So I'm inviting you today to be the leader of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may never be alone again. Help me to be still, to be filled, and to know that I am sent because I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, we put our hands together, church, man. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you.